Okay. <laughs> so how is everyone today? Good. Okay, so last time <coughs> we talked about the Fibonacci sequence and matrix multiplication uh, and things like that. So any questions about any of those things? These are all fine. Okay. So this time, we're going to talk about something that those of you who have programming experience might have noticed has been conspicuously absent uh, from our discussion. So does anyone know what I'm talking about? Loops. Loops have been conspicuously absent from our discussion. I haven't, I've purposefully not mentioned them whatsoever. Uh, however, <laughs> you might have noticed that in the test cases, I'm using some syntax that says for, blah, 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 something like that. Uh, so that syntax is, is, MATLAB syntax is something we've never talked about in this class, but it's something that does exist. And up to now, every time one of you all said loop, I said, well, what's that? I don't know. Okay, <clears throat> so to, to uh, bring up the, the topic, let's, let's consider um, a, an implementation of a MATLAB function. So I'm going to write some MATLAB syntax, and the things that are keywords, that is to say, uh, the, the, the pieces of syntax that have special significance to MATLAB, I'm going to write them in red. Just like the, just like the um, editor highlights those keywords in blue. So for example, you could, have a, you could have a variable named x, that would be fine. But you could not have a variable named function. Because MATLAB would say, no, 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 that, that's my word, you can't use that word. And what's another, what's another variable name that is not permissible for, for us? If. Else would not be possible, if would not be possible. You can't, end, <laughs> end is not possible. You can't have a variable named end. Uh, <clears throat> good. So, for example, function. Here's where you really have to think, I really have to think ahead so that, because I'm writing in pen. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to write a uh, factorial function. We're going to write factorial, but we're going to do it uh, with a loop. So the factorial, I'll call the output m, and then the function's name will be, how about fact of n, Okay, <clears throat> so the first statement that I'll say is that I'll say m is 1. I'll say m is 1 because this is uh, sort of in, in the thought that, uh, well, the, what's the lowest integer you can take factorial of? 0. And then what is, the fa what is the factorial of 0? It's 1. OK. So now I'm going to write 4. And then now I'm going to use a new variable. I'll call it k equal uh, 1 to n. So now. Just like uh, this function has its, bo its body, all the stuff that's inside of the function is indented one position, uh, the end of the function is here, so end. Just like the, just like the function has its uh, body, its beginning and its end, the for loop has its beginning and its end, so something like this. And what we need to do is we need to fill in the body of the loop so that this function will, compute, will, will be computing factorial. OK. So what this is going to do, 
what this loop is going to do is that we're going to execute the loop body and you're going to execute the body for for every value between 1 and n. So it's going to say uh, it's going to execute it once for k is 1, once for k is 2, once for k is 3, all the way up to k is n. Okay, so that means that as this loop body executes, k is going to take these sequential values. So what should we be doing in that, in that loop body? We'll need to be updating the value of m, right? We'll need to be updating the value of m. So we're going to need a formula that says something like m is something or other. So what should m be? m times k. Okay, so so now let's let's execute this function on pencil and paper with with a table. And what I want to convince you of is that this is really more or less the way human beings calculate uh, factorial when you when you ask them to sit down and do it. Okay. So suppose that uh, suppose that at the at the command line we say fact of say five. Well, <clears throat> uh, how many input arguments are there? One, and its name is n. And how many output arguments are there? One, and its name is m. And then for for uh, internally, there's even one more argument that that's neither input nor output, but it's something that we use to construct the output. What's its name? K. So there's three symbols. One of them is an input symbol, one of them is an output symbol, and one of them is internal only to the function. So we're going to need to make a table <coughs> that has three columns. So M, N, and K. Okay. So when, when the when the function enters, we only know one of the values. What value is it that we know? We know n. And what, what is the specific value of n? It's 5. OK. Then unconditionally, the first thing that we do when we enter the function, we, we make an immediate definition for which variable? m. So now we know that n is 5, and we also know that m is 1. And notice that, so far at least, uh, k doesn't have a value yet. OK. <clears throat> so now we're going to uh, enter the loop body. So entering the loop body, this gives us, uh, for the first time, a value for which variable? K. <clears throat> so now we'll know that 1, uh, that m is 1, n is 5, and k is 1. So k first has a value now. And now we're going to update the value of which variable? We're going to update the value of m. And how are we going to update it? By multiplying it by k. Now, as it happens, k is currently 1, so that's the same as doing nothing. But, all right. So we're up updating the value of m to be 1, and then like this. So now what's happened is that we, we entered, and we just executed this line, and now we've come to the end of the loop. Well, what happens now? <laughs> you loop, right? <laughs> it, is, it is like you jump back up here, and then you say, OK, give me the next value of k. So, so as a, so you know, con conceptually, you might think that 
that what MATLAB is doing is it reads all of this, does this, does this, and then it sees the end, and then it, go, and then it jumps back to the top. Okay. <clears throat> As a result of the jump back to the top, exactly one variable changes. Which variable changes? K changes. So 1, 5, and then the next value of K is 2. <clears throat> okay, so then MATLAB updates the value of K, <clears throat> and uh, then it enters the loop body. There's just one line of code in the loop body, and that line of code is the, the, the update for m. So what is going to be the new value of m? 2. This is 5, and this is 2. Okay, so now what happens? Right, we jump back to the top of the loop and ask for the next value. Okay, <clears throat> so m is currently 2, m is still 5, and then we ask for the next value. Uh, the next value is 3. And so now we enter the loop body. So we just asked for the next value, we received the value 3, and now we enter the loop body. This is where we update the value of m, so what is the updated value of m? 6, n is still 5, k is unchanged. So we've reached the end of the loop body and jump back to the top and ask for the, nac for the next value of k, which is 4. So we asked for the next value of k, and then we entered the loop body, and now we need to update m. <coughs> What's the updated value? 24. N is still the same. K is still the same. And now we've reached the end of the loop. So we jump back to the top. We obtain the new value of K, which is 5. M and N are unchanged as a result of that. Now we're inside of the loop body and we can update the value of m, and what is the updated value of m? 96. Not 96. <laughs> 120. <clears throat> this is 6. This is 5. And, and then, okay, so now here we are is right here. We said, okay, give me the, give me the next one. Now what happens? Yeah, MATLAB says, well, that's all the ones that you asked for. So, yes? Why did become 6? Uh, it shouldn't have. I'm not sure why that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea what happened there. <laughs> yeah, I guess that, that's probably it. Just got, <laughs> just got tired of writing fives. <laughs> uh, so, now you've reached the end of the loop. And MATLAB says, well, you only asked for k to go through from 1 to 5, so I'm, so I'm done. So what happens is, is that MATLAB says, OK, I'm not jumping back to the top, so now I'm here. I'm at the end of the function. And then the caller asked for the value of m. So the return value is what? 120. Which, of course, is the factorial of 5. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's have another one. What if, <clears throat> what if instead uh, you ask for, say, so this is a, a different execution. What if you ask for the fact factorial of, say, so I think we can all agree that if I said factorial of 10, then we could make a table that's tw twice as tall as this one, and we could do it, right, one step at a time. Uh, well, what if I ask for the factorial of 0? Let's think about what that means <coughs> for a moment. So in the first place, what is the factorial of 0 by definition? 1. It's 1, right? 0 factorial is 1. But what will this, what will this function do in, in response to such a request? Well, first it will automatically assign m equal 1, because that's what we told it to do. Right. And then the loop is defined for k 
cave between 1 and n, and I guess if n is greater than 1, there's nothing between 1 and n, so the loop won't run? Question <laughs> mark? It just won't run. So if we, if we enter in, uh, the, the, in the first place, when we enter, we, there's still three variables, one input, one output, and one internal variable. Uh, if we do that, when we first enter, we know the value of exactly one variable. Which variable? In, and what is its value? Zero. It's zero. And then the next thing that we do is we unconditionally assign a value for which variable? Yeah. M. We say, well, it's just got to start out being 1. And then you say, <coughs> OK, MATLAB, I'd like for k to take on all of the integer values that are greater than or equal to 1 and less or equal to 0. How many, in how many integer values are, on the one hand, greater, or, greater than or equal to 1 and also less than or equal to 0? Precisely none of them. None, right? The, the set of integers which satisfy those constraints is empty. So we'll, we'll do this exactly none times, right? So this just won't even occur. So, so the comment here <coughs> is that this notation, if you were to write this to MATLAB, 1 to 3, MATLAB would interpret interprets this as uh, we're talking about the, the, the ordered set of values 1, 2, 3. That's what, how MATLAB views this request. Uh, what, what would, uh, say, 5 to 7 be? 5, 6, 7. What would, uh, how about mm, 8 to 8 be? the ordered set containing exactly one value, 8. And then what we're asking for here, what we're asking for here is we're saying, MATLAB, I want you to tell me about all the integers that are on the one hand greater than or equal to 1, and on the other hand less or equal to 0. Ah, there is nothing. Th this is the empty set. So the ordered set which contains no elements. Okay, so as a result, the execution of this function is now finished. What's the answer? It's 1, which is, of course, in agreement with the mathematical definition. Okay, any question about this? This is okay. All right. How about another one that's familiar? So I'm not going to give it. Uh, I'm not going to give it a dictionary name. I'm just going to give it a letter name, and I want y'all to see if you can figure out what what function it, it really is. So function, uh, how about uh, which one do I want to do? Uh, it'll be. So it'll be <laughs> but that one doesn't have a loop, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, this it'll be too obvious. Well, okay. We'll just do it. Q and R <laughs> is equal to D of uh, N and D. This is the guess the natural function. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so what, what, just by, just by the name, what, what probably are we, yeah, the division, right? Without basic coefficients. Yeah, well, yes, this is the division algorithm, not the, not the GCD one. It's not GCD. Okay, so then, so then it is like, what well, the way we're going to answer this question is we're going to, the, the question we're going to ask is something like, 
Suppose that I give you a pile of 23 M&Ms and I want you to break it into groups of size 4. Then how many groups of size 4 can you make from a pile of 23 M&Ms? You can make five such groups and then how many will be left over when you've done this? Three. Okay, so then in this case, the, the, res the, the, the response should be that, that the quotient is five and the remainder is three. Okay, so w we did this already. We already solved this problem, uh, but we did, it with, uh, we did it with functions only, right, with no loops. So here we're going to see, well, how would, you, how would you do it with a loop? Okay. Well, <coughs> let's think of it in this way. So, so suppose I just, you know, put that pile, put that pile right in front of you, and said, "Okay, start, start doing it." Then, then at that time, when I say, "Okay, start," how many, uh, how many groups have you made? Zero. Zero. So this is, this should be the first value for what? For Q. For Q. So we should initialize Q to be zero because we haven't taken away uh, any groups. So the first value for Q should be Q is zero. And then uh, we also need to know how much is left. Right, so, so suppose that I, I, I do it exactly this way, that I've got a, a bucket with 23 M&Ms and I just, just pour them out right there in front of you and say I need you to break it into groups of size 4. Then, then suppose that right then you, you, you agree, then how many do you have left? 23. So what should be the initial value for R? Should be N, right? That's how much, that's how much we have left. to go. So now what we want to do <coughs> is we want to repeatedly, repeatedly take away, uh, we want to repeatedly, if, if we're doing 23 and 4, we want to repeatedly take away 4 as long as we can. So we want to take away 4 as, as, as long as we can. But notably, this is a little bit different situation uh, than the previous one. So on the factorial, because I said, for example, compute the factorial of 5, you knew that you had to execute that loop body exactly 5 times. And if I said compute the factorial of 23, you'd have to compute that loop body exactly 23 times. That's what you'd have to do. Whereas here, it's not clear exactly how many times you're supposed to, you're supposed to evaluate a loop body. Because if you did know, if you did know exactly how many times you were supposed to compute the loop body, then what? You've got the answer. <laughs> then you'd know what Q was, right? Because Q is exactly how many times we're going to have to execute the loop body. So we can't, we can't know Q in advance. So what I'm trying to bring out for you is that there's two styles of loop. One of the styles is a for loop, which is what we did on the previous exercise. And that style is when the computation is such that you know you're going to have to do something exactly this many times. Okay, so if you want to compute, say, the Gauss function, Gauss of 24, you're going to have to do something exactly 24 times. And if you want to compute the factorial function, you're going to have to do something, fa say, factorial of 50, you're going to have to do something exactly 50 times. But we don't know how many times we're supposed to do this. So we need a different style of loop. <laughs> yeah. So how, how do we know that we, we can proceed at least one more step? When what? When R is greater than, greater than or equal to D, right? Right, because imagine you're a child, okay, and then I say, you know, we're talking about M&Ms, and I say make them groups of size four. <coughs> if there were four more on the table, would you take that group? Yeah, you would, because you, <laughs> you might be able to, 
you might be able to eat them. You know, who knows what the teacher's going to say, right? So the condition is greater or equal. So that's how we know that we're able to proceed. So this style of loop has the keyword while. So while what remains is greater than or equal to the size of the group that you are supposed to make. Okay, so then while loop will have its body and end, and function will have its body and its end. Okay, and what we need to do is we need to, inside of that loop, write down, for, for MATLAB's sake, what, what is it that you do in the, in the M&M game? Well, we need to update, what we're going to need, need to do is we're going to need to update Q and also update R. So how do we update Q? What's going to be the formula for Q? Yeah. We're going to have to add one more to it because getting in here means that, oh, we're able to make at least one more group. So that means that the correct value of Q is one more than whatever it was previously. Okay. Then we're also going to need to update the remainder. So what's the new value of the remainder? R minus D. And why is that the, why, in terms of M&Ms and buckets and whatever, why is that, what does that mean? Yeah. It's, you're saying, okay, if we're doing 23 M&Ms into groups of size four, what this is saying is that, okay, well, I started with zero groups and there were 23 left. So, uh, is 23 more than four, greater than or equal to four? Yeah. So I can make a group, so I, I mark out, okay, I made a group, one more group than I had, and then I, I take away four from the pile, and then just keep going. All right, <clears throat> let's try this. Suppose that we're at the console, and type QR is the division of 23 and 4. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, then, how many uh, input arguments are there? Two, and what are their names? N and D. How many output arguments are there? Two. Two, what are their names? Q and R. Q and R. And how many purely internal variables are there? None, right? So this is a little bit different than the factorial function on the previous page which had, which, had a, which had a variable k which was neither an input argument nor an output argument. So this one doesn't have anything that's purely internal. So in order to model this computation on paper, we'll need uh, four, four columns. So n, d, Q R. So as a result of this being the call, in the very first place, we only know the value of two variables. What variables? N and D. And specifically, we know them to be 23 and 4. And we know nothing else. Okay, then, unconditionally, what? We define Q. We say, well, in the first place, it's just got to be the case that Q starts at 0. So we know 23, 4, and 0. And then, unconditionally, we do what? We define R. So now it's 23, 4, 0, and 23. Okay, then what? We, then we ask ourselves a question. So 
at the present time, is it the case that r is greater than or equal to d? Yeah. It is the case, right? Because what's the, what's the present value of r? 23, and what is the present value of d? 4. So that, so that is true. As a result, we will enter the loop body. OK, <clears throat> so we do enter the loop. And is still, and as a result, we're going to uh, execute that line. 23, <coughs> 4, and then we'll execute this line. And what do we get? 1. Q is 1. This is still 23. And then we execute the next line. And what's the new value of R? 19. 19. So now we've reached the end of the loop and MATLAB jumps back to the top. But it, it doesn't generate the next value in a sequence. Rather, what is it going to do? It's going to check this condition. Is this condition at now true? So is it true? Yes. Yes, because 19 is, in fact, greater than or equal to 4. And I'd like to point out that this is exactly analogous to you being a small child and looking at a pile of 19 M&Ms and asking, can I take away four? OK. <coughs> so 23, 4. Yes, that condition is true. As a result, we'll increment q to be 2. And then we'll decrement r to be what? 15. And it just continues on its merry way. So now I'll do this last bit quickly since it's, I think, be becoming obvious what's happening. So 23, 4, 3, 15. 23, 4, 3, uh, 11. Is it not 11? Did I make a mistake? It is. OK, 23. Uh, what? Where did I make an error? <laughs> I believe you that I made an error. I just can't see it. You're right. Oh, wait. You're doing it. 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 You're so I just incremented Q, so now I'm going to decrement R. Darn, I ran out of vertical space. <coughs> OK, so then I just decremented R, which means I jump back to the top. This is still 23. This is still 4. Now I'm going to increment Q to be 5. This is still 7. Now I'm going to decrement R to become 3. OK, so now I've just jumped. So I just did this line. I just evaluated that line. And now I've come to the end of the loop. And now I jump back to the top. And now is the first time where something is is, is different. What's different now? The while condition is not. Right. This, the condition which must, which must be met to enter into the loop body, r greater than or equal to d, is now false. It's false uh, because you can see that uh, r is 3 and d is 4. So as a result, what happens? You exit the loop. And if there was anything written right here, if there was anything right there, then now you'd start doing that. But there is nothing written right there, so then now you've hit the end of the function, and then what? You leave, and the response is now these two output variables, 5 and 3. So is that in agreement with when we were talking about what if, what if I gave you 23 M&Ms and said make groups of size 4? So is that in agreement? Yeah, it's in agreement. Good. So, so 
what I want to stress, not overstress, but stress a little bit at least, is that there are, there's two styles of loop. One of them syntactically is called a for loop. The other one syntactically is referred to as a while loop. Conceptually, as a matter of computation, what they represent, a for loop is like saying, I know exactly how many times I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do this exactly n times. A while loop is saying, well, I know I'm going to have to do this a, potentially many times, but I don't know at the present time how many times I'm going to have to do it. Okay. So, uh, to, to be clear, or maybe not, par partially for clearness and partially for completeness, suppose that I ask, Again, I say, well, what's, what, what if we evaluate this function uh, at, say, 23 and 70? Because <laughs> why not, right? So what, what, are we, what, are, what is being asked in terms of M&Ms? Right. It's like saying, OK, here's 23 M&Ms, and I want you to make groups of size 70. So, so just ignoring the code for a moment and just thinking about M&Ms, suppose that I say, okay, class, uh, I've put 23 M&Ms in front of you, and I want you to make as many groups of size 70 as you can and tell me what the quotient of remainder is, and if you do it correctly, you get to eat the remainder. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's, what's the quotient? Zero, and then what's the remainder? 23. Now, does our definition agree? Does, it, does the MATLAB definition, will it compute that? Mm -hmm. Yes, because what's going to happen is that we'll make the same table. We'll, we'll, we'll begin with similar table. So n is, we'll, we'll have n and d and q and r. When we first enter, uh, n is 23 and d is 70. And then we unconditionally, which is to say that there's no if, there's no while, there's no none of that. We just immediately, the first thing that we do is we say q0 unconditionally. And then the very next thing we do is say that r is 23 because r is n. And now here's where we ask ourselves, OK, now we have to start doing the iterative phase, the part where we're going to do the loop. So, at, so what, is the, what is the condition that has to be true in order to enter into the loop? R greater than or equal to D. Is that true? That means that how many times is the loop body going to be executed? Zero times. So in, in, in you, you might metaphorically say that, OK, we're just going to jump over the loop. If there was anything here, we'd execute it now, but there's not, so there's nothing to do. And then we hit the end of the function and leave. So what's the answer? Okay. So is that is that the correct answer? Mm -hmm. It is. Good. So any question about this? So now what we're going to do is that uh, we have we've we've solved uh, many different exercises so far, you know, like the Gauss function and, and whatever, you know, all, all the different things that we did. And we did it all without loops. So now we're going to do all of them again. And we're going to do them with loops now. Okay? So it's really not as big of a deal as, as you might think. Uh, because once you've done them with functions, uh, then translating your working answers into ones for loops really for each one is on the order of a couple minutes. Okay, good. So now you might ask a fair question and say, uh, well, why did we do it? There's a lot of fair questions you could ask. 
you could say, well, why did we do it with functions? Or you might say, well, if functions already work, why are we doing it with loops? <laughs> or you might say, if we already did it one way, why are we doing it two different ways? <laughs> okay, so, so the answers to, to these are, are, are the following. Is that this is a math class. Okay, and the in, in, in math, the central objects of study are functions. That's the central objects. Uh, because what, in, in the end, what, what math is interested in is, is, it, is it's saying, suppose we, have, suppose we have a group of things and we're able to perform some action upon them and make new things. Okay, those are called functions. That's what they are. When, when there's exactly one output for every input. When there can be multiple outputs for, for a given input, then it's not called a function. What's it called? Mapping, Mapping is, a, is a synonym for function. Relation. Relation. Okay, so then we, when there's potentially multiple outputs for a given input, then, then uh, the name is relation. But you can actually get around this, and you can say, you can say that, uh, you can say that, well, no, I'm going to just take the output to be a set, and then now a relation can be viewed as a function. <laughs> so, so in a very strong sense, uh, the central objects of study in math are functions. So my, my desire was to make everything look like a function, because that's, that's how math is done. In the second place, uh, loops are kind of an implementation detail. And to, to, a, to a great extent, the implementation details of the way something works on the inside is just not relevant. So, for example, um, uh, you know, I drove here this morning. But, and, and even though I have somewhat of a good idea of the way the, the internals of the internal combustion engine of my vehicle works, even though I have a general idea. In fact, I don't really know exactly what's happening, right, to the finest detail. I don't know the timings of it. I don't know what's happening. All that I do actually know is that if I provide certain inputs to my vehicle, then certain outputs occur, right? I hit the accelerator, it goes. I turn the thing, I turn the steering wheel, it turns. It's just not relevant exactly what's happening inside. It's just not relevant uh, because, you know, I'm just using it as a, as a means. So what I'm telling you is that to, to a large extent, when you write programs, it's just not relevant what's happening inside. The only thing that matters is whether or not the, the input that's provided it produces exactly the output that's specified. Okay, so to that end, all of your, all of your functions uh, there's a, there's a, the largest component of the grading of your functions is just those test functions that say, well, if I, if I take your function and I give it this input, does it produce the correct output? That's what those test cases are. Okay, for all, for all those test cases, no, y y your, your functions could contain ha hamsters and squirrels and somehow they're doing whatever they're doing, right? Somehow the hamsters and squirrels have a debate about about what the output should be, and then and then they come to a conclusion and they output it. Okay, and that would be fine. If my if I if I were to go out to the parking lot, and 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 observe that actually, giraffes power my vehicle, that would be interesting, but also not relevant. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so, the the implementation details of a function are in that way just not relevant. Uh, then you might, then you might further ask, well, why? Why, why is, why are there loops when functions apparently can do everything that loops can? Uh, the reason comes down to this, is that, okay, where, where vehicles are concerned, there actually is some slight relevance as to how they work on the inside. So, uh, for example, it would in principle be possible to make a vehicle that could get you from point A to point B over the course of several miles and it's powered by a hamster wheel, like a literal hamster, okay? By just having, by enticing this hamster to run on a wheel, 
and then it generates enough torque, okay, and you, you, have, an, you have the proper gearing ratio, that hamster could actually end up pushing the vehicle forward incredibly slowly. But in principle, the hamster could do it, right? The, the, a hamster might be able to generate enough energy over its lifetime. You might have to substitute in new hamsters, right? <laughs> okay. That's a good over the course of its lifetime to, to achieve the amount of energy to move you from point A to point B. Okay? So in principle, it's possible. But then, like, okay, we actually want it, you know, you actually want to drive at highway speeds. Okay, a hamster couldn't do a it. A lot of hamsters. <laughs> you could do it with lots and lots of hamsters, potentially. Okay, but one hamster alone couldn't do it, right? They, because viewing a hamster just as an object and not as a creature that's precious and everything like that, <laughs> they, they can only generate so much output. They can only generate so much power, that is energy over time. Okay, so what a loop is, and the whole reason why loops exist in programming languages instead of just functions, the whole reason why they exist is that the way the actual machine works, the way the actual silicon, if you were to get out a piece of silicon, if you were to take one of those machines, dissect it, and look at it with a microscope and, and view how it actually works, what a loop is, is it's a, very, uh, it, it's a very close approximation of what that machine actually can do, of what the machine's actually doing. So what I'm telling you is what loops are is they're a way to talk to the machine to make it do its task as fast as possible. Okay? So what I'm telling you is, and I don't want you to get too excited because this is really not that great, uh, what I'm telling you is that generally speaking in MATLAB if you have two functions and one of them is written with a loop and one of them is written with a recursion the way we've been doing it up to now, if all other things are equal, the one with the loop is going to execute slightly faster. So if you, if you were to take the factorial function that we already did, or the, no, 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 we did the Gauss one, I wrote the factorial one. So if you took your Gauss function that computes the, the, the py pyramidal numbers, the recursive one is going to execute slightly slower than the one you're going to write <laughs> that has a loop. It's going to be slightly better. So it's like, it's like, it would be like putting in a slightly bigger hamster, right, <laughs> to make it go faster, like a guinea pig, right? Not a hamster, a <laughs> guinea pig. Okay, good. So any questions about, about that? Okay. <clears throat> but you should know, for those of you who are interested in programming languages and things like that, uh, there's, there's entire families of programming languages that don't even have loops. And rather, what they're able to do is that if your function has a certain property, then they're able to translate it into something that, just, that is equivalent to a loop. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So after all that ranting, now let's change to uh, a completely new topic. So any question before we change to a new topic? Yes? So for the loop functions for and while, are they interchangeable or do you have to be specific? Like if you like, correct the for one, technically you should know how many iterations you want. Yes, but the, 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 the benefit of using four, so, so let me answer your question. I'll, I'll answer it this way. So here's an example of us using four. Now I'm going to write an exactly equivalent function that, that does the exact same thing but with while. So, so far it's, it's, so far it is, in fact, exactly the same, so far. Uh, then I'm going to write k is equal to 1, 
And now I'm going to start, instead of writing a for loop, I'm going to start a while loop. So now it's going to be while k is less or equal to n. So now, it, now it's different. So I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to do this same bit. This same bit, I'll have to say m, uh, m is m multiplied by k. And I'll write end here. And I'll write end here. So now, this function that I've written is not complete. Why is it not complete? Right. So as it's, as it's written, as, as this one is written, this piece of syntax, every time you jump in here, every time you hit this top, this top of, the, of the loop, of the for loop, MATLAB gives you the next value of k. And if we were to execute this function as written, we'd say k is 1. And then if supposing we were, again, computing the factorial of 5, we'd ask, is 1 less or equal to 5? It is. So let's do this. And then jump back, the, back to the top. And then it would ask, again, is 1 still less, than f less or equal to 5? It is. So let's keep going. And it would, just, it would never leave this. And you know, <laughs> if you were to execute this function at the console, it would just start running, and then you'd just wait forever. It would never stop. So to get this, to, 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 to make this right, you, you're going to have to explicitly say, I want you to give me the next value of k, please. So now these two functions, these, these two functions are now equivalent. So the benefit of, of using a for loop from, from, the, from, the, from the writing a function point of view is that, well, you end up having to write a little less because it, it, to do the same thing with a while loop, you had to say, well, initialize k to be 1, and then at the end of the loop, do this. Whereas we didn't have to do either one of those things over here in the for loop style. Second is that when you're reading it, and when you end up writing programs, uh, if you end up doing it a lot, the majority of your time is actually not spent writing programs. The majority of your time is spent reading programs because you're trying to figure out what that program is supposed to be doing. So the other benefit to this style from, from the reading point of view is that by virtue of this being a for loop, it's telling you that this is the kind of loop where we know the number of times this loop is supposed to execute in advance. We know before we even get there how many times we're supposed to do it. Whereas this one, this, this loop still has that property. We, we still know exactly how many times this is supposed to execute, but because it's stated as a while, it's not clear that, that, this, that this loop has the property that you already know how many times it's supposed to execute. Good question. Other questions? OK. <clears throat> so now for something completely different. Not really. A little bit different. So now we're going to talk about uh, sorting. Sorting is one of the major, um, one of the major tasks in in all the programming and computer science and things like this. And that is to say, what if, <coughs> what if, uh, for example, I give you this list of numbers, uh, eight. 7, 3, 5, 1, 2, 1, 9. And I say, OK, this is, a, this is a list of numbers. And what I want you to do is I want you to take this list and keep all of them. So how many are in there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There's eight elements in the list. I want you to, to respond to me with another list that still has exactly these eight elements but they're in increasing order. So now, that is to say the smallest one is first and the, big, and the, and the, and the, the biggest one is last. 
Okay. So now human beings are from from a, from like a computational point of view almost magical because I'm sure that right now I that you could just respond right now you could just you could just write it down eight numbers they're all in the all in order. Okay, and then who knows what was going on inside your head, <laughs> right? That did that, right? Who knows what you did? Now the question is is okay, what if we want to tell MATLAB to do it? How would you tell MATLAB to do it? So here's the thing. One of the things you need to come to grips with comparing yourself to MATLAB is that when you look at this, when you look at this, more or less a human being can look at all eight of these numbers and see them, in a sense, all at the same time. You can see all of them. But MATLAB is not able to do that in any real sense. But what MATLAB really can do is look at any two of them at the same time. And I could, I could make it be like that for you if instead of giving you eight numbers, I gave you eight million numbers. Because there'd be no way for you to consider all eight million of them at the same time. So, so but you could consider a, a few of them at the same time. So what I'm saying is that let's, let's treat the problem as if we're only ever allowed to consider two of them at the same time. Because because then we could do it, do it that way with MATLAB. Okay. <clears throat> so let, let's play that game. So here's, here is one way, not a very good way, but one way to, to, to sort this list. We'll just consider them two at a time. So how about, and I want them to be in increasing order, that is to say smallest first. So these two, are these two in the correct order, just the first two? They're not. They're not in the correct order. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just switch them. Right? I'll switch those two. So now, now those two are in the correct order. So now, we still have a list, it still has eight elements, it's still not sorted, but it's a little bit better than it was before, wasn't it? Okay, now let's consider the next two. Just eight and three now. And I'll ask, are these in the right order? They're not. So what are we gonna do? Switch them. So now it's seven, three, eight, five, one. Two, one, nine. <clears throat> okay, now we'll consider the next two. Are these in the right order? They're not, so we'll switch them. Seven, three, five, eight, one, two, one, nine. <clears throat> the next two, they're not in the right order. We'll switch them. Seven, three, <clears throat> one, eight, two, one, nine. The next two, next pair. <clears throat> Seven, three, five, one, two, eight, one, nine. The next pair. Seven, three, five, one, two, one, eight, nine. And the last pair. What's the story on the last pair? Ah, they're in the right order. Finally, we found some that didn't have to be played with. So now, we still, at, at every instant of this procedure so far, we've still had a list that had exactly eight elements in it. Uh, at the present time, is it in sorted order? It isn't. But it's marginally more sorted than it was. <laughs> right. It, 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 it isn't. Right. So it's not sorted, but, it, but, it's, but it's more nearly sorted than it was before. 
So now, uh, what do we need to do? Start, <laughs> Start back at the beginning. <laughs> right. So now we won't finish this, but I want to get a little. I want to make a little bit of progress so that you can see what you would do. So now, start back at the beginning, and you ask, okay, well, how about those? Are they in the right order? They're not. So three, seven, five, one, two, one, eight, nine. How about these two? Are they in the right order? They're not. So we'll so we'll switch them. Three, five, seven, one, two, one, eight, nine. Okay. So now we'd go back through, and you'd see another staircase. So a staircase of you you can think of this is where MATLAB's eyeballs are. Here, 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 here. Then we'll you'll see it again. Here, 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 all the way down. And you'll you'll switch them when you have to. So how can you tell when you're finished? When you traverse an entire staircase and you didn't have to do any switches. If you traverse an entire staircase and there's no switches, well, then it must be the case that, that, that the list itself was sorted. Now, that being said, so, so what I've demonstrated for you by, by hand is I've demonstrated for you a way that you could, you could sort any list of numbers. Now, another thing that you need to consider is that, that you need to know is that this is a terrible way to go about doing this. It's just terrible. If you were to take, say, all the books in the library, have you ever been there? Did you know we have one? <laughs> if you were to take them all and put them in, a, in a one long shelf, you can imagine that we just made some big long shelf and they're all on the same shelf, then I could set you to the task of please order these books by title. Okay. Uh, then in principle, you could do it by just saying, okay, I'll start at, the, start at the leftmost bit and ask, are these two in the right order? And if not, switch them. And then do the next one and then switch them. And then just keep doing it. Okay, but here's the thing. There's so many books in the library. If you were to take this method, if you were to try to do that, this method, to, to, to sort the books in the library, it would take you thousands, probably tens of thousands of years to do that. But I'll tell you right now that if you knew a better way, a different way, then you could do it in principle in just maybe a day instead of thousands and thousands of years. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about next time. Okay, so have a nice uh, whatever day it is. <laughs>